You may be seated. I want to welcome you to Harlan Community Church. My name is Nathan, and if you're new here, I just want to welcome you for the first time. And in your bulletin, there is a connection card. We'd love to have you fill that out, drop it in the bulletin so we can get to know you a little bit more and be able to connect with you uh, in whatever way uh, possible with that. I just want to mention a few things uh, that are going on. You know, we're getting really close to school starting up, which means family night starting back up, which also means Wednesday night meals also start up. So starting right there in the front row, there's a clipboard that will be starting to pass around so we, we can get those meals taken care of. I, I love this. This is one of the best things that we do. I love how many kids come here on a Wednesday night. It's, it's amazing. So we're, we're getting those uh, meals kicked up and the first week is going to be September 9th, the, the Wednesday right after uh, Labor Day. So I'm excited about getting those started. Tomorrow Tomorrow also we have a 120th anniversary committee meeting, but it's we're going to expand it. Uh, so uh, beyond the committee now, we're bringing in other people. So if you're interested in planning the 120th anniversary for uh, October 11th and get on those planning uh, meetings, uh, come on in tomorrow. Uh, we'll have me right in here and uh, talk a little bit more about that. I'm excited about Hunt celebrating 120th. Are you guys? Yeah. yeah. Be excited. This, this is a big thing, big accomplishment as a church. Not a lot of churches get to be 120 years old, but we do, and we're going to celebrate it with a big old birthday party, so it'll be fun. Also, on Tuesday is our annual, uh, monthly board meeting, so please come for that if you're on the board, uh, 7 o'clock. Also, Saturday, we're going to have a group uh, meet here or at Ellen's house, uh, old house, and help uh, clear uh, stuff from that. Uh, and that'll be at 8.30 also. Next Monday, if you're part of uh, Wednesday night and, and all those um, uh, family nights, we'd love to get together, have a kind of leadership growth meeting, kind, kind of training. So that would be great if you would be able to be here. And this morning, we also want to welcome Donald Gilbert, pastor, doctor. You know, there's a lot of different titles we could give with him. But for sure, pastor of Heartland Community Church between 1982 and 1986. So who was here, by, by show of hands, attended with, with when D Donald Gilbert was the pastor? He was here. So there was a few of you. So it's, it's great to have him here. Uh, so uh, get to know him a little bit more and what he's been doing uh, in the few years uh, since then. So with that, let us have the offering and ask the ushers to please come forward and we'll pray for our tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we get to gather with you today, that we thank you that we're able to, to be blessed in a way that we can bless you back uh, by giving and, and worshiping through our tithes and offerings. So we love you, we praise you, and glorify you. We just ask that you meet with us here today and uh, guide everything that happens here, and we give it all praise, glory, and honor back to you. In your name, amen. I met Donald at uh, conference, I believe, a couple years ago, and, and we were able to chat about our, our experiences at Heartland, and, and uh, I'm glad we were able to have this experience today, where we're able to invite Donald to come here and not join with us as part of our 120th anniversary celebration. Betty and Joe, hey, how are you? Great to have you guys here with, with us this morning. Um, and, and it was just one of those things that I was really happy to have him here. He, he's done a lot since, 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 he, since he's uh, left uh, and gone on to uh, Des Moines. He's, he's gotten a, a master's from Drake University. He's gone, um, and I forget, the uh, Oxford Un University, correct, uh, in, in Tennessee. Uh, got a doctorate from there. And now he's opened up his own practice, uh, New Life Counseling. Uh, in Des Moines, and he's able to do all kinds of counseling there. He's also a consultant. He's also a, a life and, and coach from, uh, trained by uh, John Maxwell teams. That's a relatively popular name, uh, if, if you know anything about leadership. But it, it, it is amazing, and we're grateful to have uh, Donald Gilbert here with us this morning. So give him a warm welcome. So 
Yeah, you can hear me. I can hear myself. That's great. Yeah, you, you know, sometimes uh, when you get older and don't have hair, you know, your uh, ears aren't as uh, good as they used to be. 120 years, that means I'm half the age of this church. How about that? Bet you didn't know that. You're older half than that, half and half. He's in half and half. Half of the half. There you go. Um, my wife, Debbie, could not be here. For some of you who know her, some of you have been here before when I was here. Um, she actually had to, um, uh, this past week, put her mom in a nursing home. Her mom has dementia really bad, so that's been a real struggle. Um, I talked to her when I got into the parking lot here, and she's about ready to leave Oklahoma probably about an hour ago. So uh, she um, wanted to, to have me tell you hello and that she, um, sorry she couldn't be here for those of you who, who know her. Um, we had four kids. Those of you who do not know me, which is most of you, uh, we had four kids. Uh, our oldest daughter, Heather, actually started kindergarten here in LaPorte many, many years ago. Uh, she's actually 35 now. She has three children. They live in Boone, Iowa. Her husband actually is a um, manager of the UP Railroad. And um, my second daughter, Megan, I think most of you would have known her when she was, what, maybe three when she was here first? She is married, has three children, and her fourth child is due the end of October. And she's married to a Minnesotan. I just, uh, oh well. She lives in Rochester, Minnesota, what can I say? Uh, she went to uh, Northwestern and St. Paul for college and married a Minnesotan. And so she's there, there in Minnesota. Uh, we give him a hard time. He, they actually own and operate a part of three to five businesses. My son-in-law is an entrepreneur, um, bar none. Um, he has already, by the time he's like 34, I think now, and by the time he was like 30, he had already started and sold in several businesses. So that's my son-in-law. Um, I have a son, Brian, who was actually born, for those of you who remember, in the parsonage because we had a midwife and we had uh, our son at home in the parsonage, but you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> but you can look in the archives of Des Moines Register and there is a whole spreadsheet on him and pictures and everything, so he was famous when he was born. Um, that's what we tell him anyway. Um, not too often because he's a pretty smart kid. He actually is an, um, a computer program, works for one of the big insurance companies in Des Moines, EMC. He has been promoted uh, several times since he's been there, and uh, I don't really know. He makes more money than I do. What can I say? I have a doctorate, and he has a bachelor's degree, but he makes more money because he knows how to com program computers. Isn't that a wonderful world? You know, when I was in high school, most of the computer business, uh, computers didn't exist. How many of you know that when you were in high school, computers didn't exist? How many of you? Yeah. See, that really shows us how old we really are, right? Yeah. Well, that's okay. Uh, we're in good crowd and good business. Uh, my youngest daughter, Sarah, uh, was born in Des Moines. Most of you then don't probably know her. She is my photographer, videographer. She actually spent uh, six months in Europe. She has a French degree. She went to France. Uh, she went to UNI and Hawkeye Tech. She actually has a photography degree and a communications degree from UNI. She's married, has two little children, a little four-year-old autistic boy, and a little girl, Izzy. So I have nine and three quarters, nine, almost 10. I have 10 grandchildren. How about that? It's wonderful. The month of August was grandma and grandpa. We had everyone but two of the littlest at our house over three weekends. So it's been kind of exhausting. Just got to tell you. But they're wonderful, aren't they? They're wonderful. Lots of things have happened since 1986. Um, we have gone through many different kinds of things. Uh, Heather, uh, we have found when she was actually in college at Oklahoma Wesleyan, uh, she came down uh, very sick. And uh, she was a sophomore in college. We had to pick her up, and she almost passed, uh, passed away at 19. Uh, we found out at that particular time that she has Crohn's disease. So she is in remission at this particular point. She's 35 but has Crohn's and lupus. 
and she has three children, uh, Dawson, who is 10, and um, Emma Grace, who is not eight now, eight now, boy, they're all having birthdays in, in the fall, so I have to remember, and then little Aubrey, who had just turned five. Um, Heather has um, gone through a lot in her life, you know, at 35, having lupus and Crohn's, um, but when she was 19, um, when she almost uh, died from it within 24 hours, uh, that really changed her life. Um, they follow the Lord, a uh, good Christian family, um, and we're just happy that uh, she is doing as well as she is. Some days she has good days and some days she doesn't. But if you know anything about lupus uh, in, in Crohn's, um, it is, uh, there is no cure. And, um, you know, she will probably not live a long life. So those are some of the things that we deal with. Um, our youngest daughter, Sarah, who is the photographer, they have uh, lots of struggles with their four-year-old who is autistic, he's severely autistic. They actually were living in Waterloo at the time, and they actually had to move, and it's been a real struggle for them financially as they moved from Waterloo to Des Moines and finding jobs and because they needed to get in Des Moines because Des Moines is about the only place that they had a uh, place for him in his special school that he needed. And uh, so those are, our, or those are all some of the things that, as part of our family, if you know us and think about us, certainly um, we would uh, covet your prayers. Um, anyway, uh, you know, it, it's really interesting as uh, we sang some of the songs and as I think about some of the things that we have struggled with in our life, all of us struggle with something, right? Right? Right. If you're human and you've been alive for any length of period of time, uh, you've always struggled with something. There's something in your life that you struggle with. But you know, the reality is that God's love, God is extravagant to the core of His being. And that's a wonderful thought, isn't it? He's extravagant to the core. And the idea here is that when we understand God's extravagant love, that we can dare to dream big things. I can dare to dream that my daughter will be healed one day. I can dare to dream that, you know, when we leave this life, there is another life where no, uh, none of this stuff that we deal with is going to exist. Can you dare to dream that? And you can dare to dream that in this life God loves you enough and that no matter where you are, no matter what's happened, no matter what you've done, no matter what's going on, that God's love for you and I is so extravagant that He cannot not love you. And that's an incredible thought, isn't it? That no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what sins you may have committed in your life, no matter where you are at this present moment in your life, no matter what you struggle with, whether it's physical things or if it's emotional or mental health or family issues like my wife and my mother-in-law. God still loves us and his love is extravagant. What does that word extravagant remind you of? When you think of extravagant, what do you think? This is a great time because, you know, it's okay for you to talk back to me. Over the top. Extravagant. What do you think? out of reach. What'd you say? Big and nice. Big and nice. Extravagant. Anybody ever had an extravagant gift given to them? Uh, have you been saved? Then you've gotten an extravagant gift, haven't you? <laughs> Most of you thought I was talking about physical things, didn't you? There for a moment. But reality in this life, many of us have received things that we didn't deserve, right? I I, I have a wife that I really don't deserve. I have a wife who loves me and has put up with me for over 40 years. Our 39th wedding anniversary is this month. But she's put up with me for 40 years. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing considering who I am and that she still loves me over all these years and all the things that I have put her through and all the things that have happened in our life. But God's love is extravagant. It's unconditional. It's over the top. It's not just nice. It's abundantly more than you can even ask or imagine to ask. How many of you have a good imagination? Huh? Yeah. You know, I'll bet you if we talk to a three or four or five-year-old downstairs that they would have a much bigger imagination than you and I. Because somewhere between three and four and five, 
because they think they can fly. Have you ever watched them watch Superman or Spider-Man? Don't you think? They think, ah, you know, I got this. And you know, they imagine it as if it's real. Have you ever seen a three and four year old who heard him pray? Man, can they imagine? Can they believe? The scripture says that we need to be as the little children and come to him with that kind of faith. See, God desires us to dream. He desires us to come and ask him for extravagant things. Did you know that? Some of you have lived your life not understanding the reality of the extravagance of God's love. How limiting our minds are. How limiting our imagination is. How limiting is our ability to even dream or ask God for things. Did you know that God is for you? He's not against you. He loves you. Did you know his love is unending, unfathomable, multidimensional, multidirectional. And no matter what you and I do, he still loves you. That's extravagant. Would you agree? When I was 40, that would have been uh, 19 years ago, 19 years ago, uh, eight months, and uh, what is the day? The eighth? Six days ago. Ninth. Seven days ago. But who's counting? I broke my neck. Some of you may or may not know that. Those of you who don't know me don't know that for sure. But I broke my neck uh, January 2nd, 19 years, eight months, and seven days ago. My life changed. You would think that's an amazing thing, right? But here I am, walking, talking, moving. I can move my neck. It's amazing. I shattered my sixth vertebrae. I no longer have a sixth vertebrae. Uh, I had all kinds of pain. I don't know if anybody understands what pain is, but when you have a piece of bone that's pressed against your cervical nerve, uh, the pain is unimaginable. And then for seven days, I, I know just seven days of that kind of pain, I came to the place where, you know what, it was like if I had to live my life, the rest of my life like this, there was no reason to live. God's love is extravagant. It's amazing what a neurosurgeon can do. It's amazing immediately after the surgery, there's such a relief from the pain. God's love is extravagant. I am so glad that he gave people the ability and the knowledge and and. and and the wherewithal to desire to do that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? But just the right time in just the right place. It's amazing, isn't it? What God can do. It's amazing His power. It's amazing His love. It's amazing His presence. It's amazing His promises to us. It's extravagant. Now, if you go to the next slide, uh, that is a typo. And that is all on me. That should be Ephesians 3, not 5. You know, 3 and 5, I have no idea why my finger hit 5, but, you know, sometimes it does. It does, you know, sometimes my finger does things that I don't think it should do. And then I discover too late, well, uh, no, that's not right. That's supposed to be Ephesians 3. Okay. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me to Ephesians 3, And since uh, we all live in a very techy universe, here's my Bible. For those of you who are old school, you have the print on page. Um, it's great to have Wi-Fi here so I can pull up my Bible. The one other thing about my Bible, I have it with me. This, this is my little computer, handheld computer. Did you know that this little thing right here has more computing power than the first five computers I ever owned? Isn't that amazing? And that was only 20 years ago. It's pretty incredible, right? So here it is. Ephesians 3, starting with verse 14. We could read the whole thing, but I'm going to start with verse 14. For this very reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family, that's you and I, in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power 
through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have a power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, deep his, the love of Christ is. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Father God, thank you for your word, that it is powerful, that it is extravagant in its description of who you are. Thank you, Father, that we are here, gathered here, by your choice this morning and that we are here to hear you speak to us through your spirit in us by your power may we understand that which is not understandable and experience this extravagance of your love this morning i ask this in jesus name amen this is a powerful 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 prayer this is an incredible prayer so the first thing that we do, and you wanted to get to the next slide, just stay up with me, and, and if not, we'll, you know, I, I don't want to lose these people. Go to the next slide, and here we go. Just keep, just go all the way through this, and so all the things, there you go. So the first thing that we notice in this particular passage is the extravagant power of God. Now, if you have your Bibles, and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, and shout out, you got it, when you get there. All right. Go to, go to verse 18. This is Paul's beginning prayer in this particular chapter and this particular book. I pray that the eyes of your heart... Now, if you're a little child and you're literal, my, my, my grandson looks at me and says, we don't have eyes in our heart, our eyyes in our head. Did you catch that? The eyes of your heart, see, not what you can see physically, but what you see spiritually, the eyes of your heart. Can you see what God is telling us spiritually this morning? That's what he's saying. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened because, you know, without the enlightenment of the Spirit of God, we don't understand it. That your eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power huh? extravagant incomparable power for us who believe that's for you me his extravagant power his unimaginable power for you and I and that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, appointing him to the head of everything over the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills it every way in everything. How powerful is that? Has any, anybody ever seen power enough to raise people from the dead? Anybody? I haven't. Power? To raise people from the dead. How powerful is that? So you see, what he's saying to us is that God's power is so powerful that it can raise dead people to life. Dead to life. And in, when you and I were saved, he raised us from dead to life. Spiritually, yes? But he's also talking, not just spiritually, but he's talking physically. He's saying the power of God is able to do all things and everything in every way possible. That's extravagant. And God's power was given to you and I. That when you accepted Christ and the Holy Spirit came into your life, at that day he gave you that power. I wonder what you could dream to do with that power. Huh? Have you ever thought about that? Huh. Take a moment. If you had that kind of power to raise the dead to life, that kind of power is in you, what would you do with it? Change the world? Probably screw it up. Yeah, that's probably why he didn't give us the ability to use it at will, right? 
that power is given to us, but it is the Holy Spirit to use as he so chooses. But have you ever thought about what you would do with the power that God gave you? See, he gave you this power. It's extravagant. Why would he give that to us? Why? Don't we screw everything up? Right? Man, I say things that offend people every day. <laughs> Boy, I don't know. What would you do with that power? But do you understand the extravagance? So what's the purpose of that power? What is that power for? As you can see, you can, you can write all that stuff down if you wish. I, I probably won't read it since you can read it. I'll just keep going. Uh, okay. If, if, if you get lost, just say, I'm lost, and I'll pause and say, okay. Where'd you, where'd you stop? And I'll start over again. It's okay. Far above all power and dominion of the earth, right? So what's the purpose? What's the purpose of this power? We read that. The extravagance of the power is that he strengthened us and he's in his spirit to do our part, to be able to do and dream beyond what you and I personally and physically can do, that God's power lives within you to dream, to dare to dream, to do something for God that you and I cannot accomplish like saving people. <laughs> the power of the word is able to save, but you and I cannot. What is the purpose? To be rooted and grounded in this love. It's an extravagant understanding of God's love. Do you really understand God's love? I don't. I mean, there are moments, right? I, I still remember when I woke up and I didn't have pain in my neck and it was like, oh, wow. That was great. Uh, a year and a half ago, a year actually a year and eight months ago, it would be two years last de that December, two years ago, I guess that's what it would be. I was in a wheelchair. Yeah. I couldn't have stood up here more than three minutes. I remember going Christmas shopping Thanksgiving that year with my wife in a wheelchair. I couldn't stand, couldn't walk. The only way that I could be pain-free at that point was actually sitting down. My legs were going numb, couldn't feel my feet when I walked. The pain was excruciating. I could take maybe enough two or three minutes to stand and walk with, before I had to sit down, and the pain was so great. I wasn't on pain medication, by the way, because I can't stand it. I, I like to be in control too much. I don't like medication that causes your brain to be mushy. I, I like, I'm a control freak, so I own my own business. I, I'm just being honest. So the reality is, I looked at that and I said, okay, God, what's your purpose in this? So wh what's the purpose? Now, not the, because God did anything, because God didn't create my, my back. and That's my gene pools. That's my dad. My dad had the same surgery that I had. I don't know. I don't understand it, but we have this thing called spinal stenosis. Sounds like a really nasty thing, doesn't it? It's a disease of the spine. Um, I am permanently handicapped, whatever that means. I have no idea what that means, quite frankly, because I really don't pay much attention to it. I just like the parking sticker. <laughs> I get better parking spots. That's about all it's worth to me. That's true. Just, just saying. The reality is, I had to go to Mayo Clinic, had another operation. It was, not an, it was not fun, by the way. They have you up and walking within uh, 12 hours after the operation. I, it's just like, you know, they get you out. No, they, they wanted me to leave the next day. I convinced the doctor to stay at least one more day. Spend three or four days in a hotel room across the street because I, I couldn't even ride in the car. It was so bad. I mean, you know, I got a nine-inch scar right back here. That's probably too much information for you. But the reality is, what's God's purpose? So one of the things that you have to ask in the life, you know, I had a broken neck, I had a bad back, I, you know, all these things have happened, I, you know, I can't run anymore, I need knee replacements. Man, it sucks sometimes, excuse my language, to get old. Now, my age is 60, my brain says I'm 40. Anybody else like that? I mean, I look at some project outside and, and, you know, we got an acreage. I have no idea why I have an acreage now at 60. 
because I can't keep up with it. But I have these projects out there that I want to get done and say, oh yeah, I could get that done. You know, I'm thinking like a 40 year old and I get out there and start it and say, oh, I can't do that. It's not that fast anymore. Man, I got to sit down. That hurts. Oh man, I can't kneel anymore. Oh man, what am I supposed to, right, anybody? So what's God's purpose in all this? What's the purpose of age anyway? Have you ever thought that? Ah, yeah. It's a wonderful thing to help. So, what can we learn? What can we learn? God's purpose in our life is extravagant. Why would he want to use me? I'm a mess half the time. As I get older, probably more than that. But don't ask my wife. What's God's purpose? What's God's purpose for you? What is God's purpose? To glorify Him? God's purpose in our life is to do His work within us. He, he wants us to be rooted and grounded in His love so that we may understand His love, so that we show and share and spread the good news of God's love for Him and for others. To be rooted and grounded. You know what a rooted and grounded? It really comes with the idea of a tree. You know, we have uh, uh, some acreage. We have what they call oak acreage. We have about four and a half acres of these great big, huge, hundred-year oak trees. I mean, they are enormous. You know, you can't push those over. I mean, their roots go very, very deep, right? Rooted and grounded. So God is looking at us and saying, He wants us to be rooted like this big old oak tree. And I tell you what, we've got these oak trees. I'm, I'm not a I have no idea what trees are. I just know that my neighbor said they're oak trees. They have little acorns, so I suppose they are, right? I don't know. But you know, we got these oak trees that are about mm, 100 and almost 110 feet in the air. That's pretty, pretty tall, right? I mean, and they're straight up, and it's about 30 or 40 feet before the first branch. I mean, we got these really, really, really tall ones. And then we have these other oak trees. I, I'm told they're oak trees. I don't know. But they're oak trees, and they canopy, and they're huge. And they have this enormous canopy that is gorgeous. We have about 16 of them. One in front of our house, one in the back of our house. It's huge. Rooted and grounded. So when I think about rooted and grounded, I think about those oak trees that have roots that go forever. I don't know how deep they go, but they're, you can't push them over. And you know, when the wind comes, they sway a little bit, but they don't get pushed over. We had about an 80 mile hour wind about three years ago. And what was really interesting is there's only three trees. You know, those wind shear things, about 80 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour. That's, I didn't really know what was gonna happen. Our house was built strong enough, thankfully, but these trees, there was only three trees, three trees that actually I didn't know had a hollow spot about 20 to 30 feet up. And you know what that wind did? It twisted that thing and snapped it off at the top about 20 or 30 feet and blew the top off of those trees. That's powerful. But the tree roots kept the rest of the tree up. Now that's rooted, right? God wants you to be rooted in understanding of his love for you. And, and it's, it's extravagant. His purpose is so you and I can be grounded in the love so that we can show others his love and for him to do his work in us to be what he wants us to be, to grow us into the person that God wants you and I to be. And the other thing, the third thing we have here in this passage is the extravagance of his presence. The extravagance of his presence, it says that he, his desire is that we have God, through the Spirit of God, dwell in our hearts. The, the, the Spirit of Christ would dwell in our hearts. To be fully filled with His love. To experience His love that is intellectually unknowable. But is experientially knowable. There's two Greek words in that passage for the word to know. And one is intellectual and the other is experiential. And he said, I want you to know and experience to the fullness of of the love of God that you cannot know intellectually but you can experience through the power of his presence in your life. If anybody wants to change anything in your life, anybody have anything in their life you would like to change? Besides all the physical ailments that we have? How about the internal elements? How about how you think? 
as a counselor, one of the things that I do as a Christian counselor is we talk a great deal about people and with people about how they think certain things that from our growing up years, we may have thought certain things about ourselves that are maybe misbeliefs and lies. We may be telling ourselves things about ourselves that aren't true. No one does that, right? We're all really good about that, right? So when something goes wrong and you do something wrong, you've never said, oh man, what a stupid idiot. Anybody ever said that? Yeah. You see, when I was growing up, I have uh, two older brothers and I have a, a younger brother and sister and I have two brothers that are geniuses. And so my brother, just older than me, his name is Calvin. And I don't know what the deal was, but we were all very competitive, that sibling thing. He's about two years older than I am, and we were only one year behind. And, you know, compared to him, he never took a book home in his life. He got straight A's. Never saw him do a paper. Never saw him bring a book home. Never saw him study for a test. Never, ever, 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 ever. Now, my mom said to me, years later, thank God she didn't say it to me when I was in grade school. She said, I didn't know if you were going to graduate from grade school. Wow. I grew up comparing myself to my brother, thinking I was dumb and stupid. My grades reflected that. I don't think I got above a C. Now, I got promoted from one grade to another, so I don't know how many Fs I got, because I don't remember any of those report cards. Maybe it just said U for unsatisfactory, right? So, the interesting thing is that I didn't believe what the Word of God tells me about who I am in Christ. Huh? So sometimes the things that we think about ourselves and the things that God wants us to think about ourselves from His perspective, we sometimes have a struggle with, don't we? Sometimes I have found that people don't even really believe that God loves them because they think about all the things, all the sins, all the problems, all the things that they have done, and they focus on those rather than on the solution. So how many, of you, how many times in your life when you've done something wrong and you know you've done something wrong, even though as Paul said, I didn't want to do that, but I did it anyway. Anybody ever had that experience? Oh, yeah. How does God look at us? Have you ever focused on the sin rather than the solution? Have you ever focused on your powerlessness of the flesh rather than the power of the Spirit that lives within you to do His work in you? Far beyond what you can even dream or imagine God can do, have you ever focused on the wrong thing? God says, I want you to think this, not that. If God's love is so extravagant that he sent his only one and only son to die on the cross for you and I, that's pretty extravagant. I have one son. I'm not sure I could ever do that. Certainly not for some people that I have seen in my counseling practice and their lives. But God sent his one and only son for each of us in spite of what we have done. Even before, the scripture says in 1 John, even while we were still his enemy, would you send your only son to die for your enemy? Don't you think that's pretty extravagant? Some of us would say, that's wasteful. <laughs> what do you mean? But God did that for you too. His extravagant presence and the, last, the fourth thing is his extravagant promise. It's promise is extravagant. He desires for us to know. He desires for us to love and to ask anytime, anywhere, for anything. To dare to dream, to ask him. Did you know that you and I have the privilege because of Christ in our life that we can come before the King of Kings, the King of the universe? Anytime. For anything. Anywhere. Isn't that pretty extravagant? That, you know, if there's seven billion people in the world and we're all praying at once, that God has the ability to listen to every one of our prayers personally and answer them. Now that's extravagant. That tires me out just to think about that. To listen, I listen to people's problems every day, every day, every day. I can't imagine listening to seven billion people's problems every day. How about you? Man, it's hard enough when I had four kids listening to one of them. Yeah? Man, 
my daughters still call us. They don't call me as much as they call their mom, but I hear about it. It's like, sometimes it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're an adult. Hello. <laughs> I'm not your daddy anymore. I'm just your father. Uh, but yeah, wow. Anybody ever get tired as a parent listening to their children? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? Besides me? <laughs> and you know, God does it. God does it. Now that's extravagant, don't you think? That's extravagant. God's love is extravagant. He desires. He not only gives us the privilege, but he desires for you to come to him. Did you? He wants you to come to him. Sometimes I'm so tired out, I don't want to talk to anybody. I used to tell my children when, I, when they were growing up, you know, because I'm a counselor, I, would, I used to tell people, I, my kids, I would, I, I got to confess this, okay? You won't think less of me, will you? It's dangerous. Okay. Because uh, I don't want to be judged. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't really care. I'm going to tell you anyway. I used to tell my kids, you know what? I tell people every day these things, and they pay for it, and I give it to you for free. <laughs> Do you think they appreciated that? I don't think so. So, fourth thing. Well, the last thing on that is promise is capable and desires to do even more than we could even ask or imagine. So do we dare to dream? And so here's the pattern. The pattern is here. The pattern is to be repeated. It's continuous and for our growth. That he continuously wants us to come to him. Continuously wants us to grow. He's continuously asking us to ask him. He's continuously saying every day, every day, anytime, anywhere, come to me for anything. You know, I'm a pretty independent person. My parents really taught us how to be independent and self-sufficient, and that's probably a, not a good thing. <laughs> Asking for help is probably not my strong suit. I remember my three-year-old daughter used to say, I do it myself. I do it myself. I do it myself. Of course, she couldn't. And that reminds me of me. She is my daughter. So that's part of it. But I'm just saying that isn't that what we do? Something goes wrong. Something's happening. We, we have a struggle. We have financial problems. We have health problems. We have kid problems. We have grandkid problems. Whew. And we try to do it ourselves. Do we go to him? Do we pray? Do we say, God, man, here I am. I can't do this on my own. I need help. I need help. I remember... What, what time do I need to be done here, Pastor? Well, cut me off when, 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 it, when it's ready, okay? Okay. Um, I remember when I broke my neck when I was 40, we, had some, we were in a really, really great church. I had some really special people in our lives that were friends. We were all about the same age. We had a bunch of just families that were all together, and I just remember one day... After I broke my neck, we were broke because I was out of work. You know, I was self-employed. Um, I didn't have any money coming in. Uh, we just bought a house, um, brand new house, <laughs> just, just August before January. I had paid two mortgages for three months. I had no, no money in the bank. The IRS, I owed money to the IRS. I didn't have money for that. We were broke. We were in debt to the IRS. Anybody ever had the IRS come after you? Let me tell you, it's not much fun. I don't recommend it. I had to cash out my retirement. We had no, absolutely no money just to get the IRS off our back because they were ready to confiscate everything that I had. Um, I can go on and tell you all kinds of other things, most of which my children have never heard, although I did share some things with my youngest child the other day. I had a friend come up to me and he said, my wife and I were praying last night and, and, and we believe that God laid upon our heart and said that you needed some money and that we need to write you a check, but I don't know how much. I have this check in my hand. Can you tell me how much you need today? I'm going to cry. I, I found that the older I get, the more emotional I become. 
And you know, I told him, I can't take it. So prideful, so independent. But I learned something when I was 40 that God says to come to him and ask for anything. He asked me again, I turned him down again. He asked me a third time. I hesitated and I said, I, I, I just can't, I can't, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how. And so he said, I'm going to ask you one more time, but I want you to think. And he said, God has laid that upon our heart. And if you don't accept this, then God won't give me the blessing. Whew. Wow. I do hard. So I told him a number, and he said, looked at me and said, I know that's not enough, but I'll do what you ask. Wow. That year, I have no idea, truly, in my recovery from all that, I have no idea how God paid our bills, but he did. I can tell you story after story after story of how God has done extravagant things in my life because he loves us. The message this morning is, this is a pattern that he has created. It's his promise. It has nothing to do with me. And what God has done for me is what God has done for me because it's what he gave me. But you know, he wants to give you unique to who you are and whatever it is that you need. He uniquely loves you for you. And he's an extravagant lover. It's a pattern to be repeated in your life. It's a pattern to be repeated for all generations. And it's a pattern to be repeated for his glory. You see, God doesn't do that for you and me as much as he does it to glorify himself for others in your life to look at that because I have been telling the story forever. For almost 20 years I've been telling the story and there's not a day that I tell it that I don't cry about how extravagant his love is that I do not deserve. But he does it anyway. That's extravagant. It's over the top. I am wealthy beyond what I ever could imagine or dream to have imagined. Because in 19, almost 20 years, God has blessed us and replaced everything in my life that I've lost and then some and given me 10 grandchildren. So God loves you. It's extravagant. His love for you is beyond boundaries. He loves you as you are, where you are right now. No matter what you did last night or what you thought or said two hours ago or when you were coming to church or what, whatever happened, he still loves you. He loves you now as you are. He does not call you to come to him because you are changed. He calls you to come to him as you are so his power can change you. Let's pray. Father, wow, you blessed my socks off. Every time I share those stories of how you blessed me and your extravagance, it blesses me over and over and over and over again. And Father, my heart and my passion is to tell the story of Jesus and his love. And Father, I know your spirit is here and you've spoken into the hearts and minds of each one of us today from your word and you want to do unimaginably great marvelous and extravagant things in each of our lives father i have no idea what that is but i do know that you want to do that you desire it you just ask us to come and ask and father i don't know if there's somebody here who doesn't even know you and so the words that i have said to today uh, may not may they now i fully understand because they haven't experienced the extravagance of your love through your forgiveness. But Father, if there's someone here, I pray that you will touch them. 
And Father, if there's someone here that needs some specific need, that Father, they would come to you and they would dream to dare to ask. Because you love. Thank you, Father. And I give you praise and give you all the glory. Amen. Amen. Now there's some donuts out there. Have some coffee. Enjoy some company. Enjoy uh, fellowshipping with everybody. Uh, there's also a table full of uh, new life counseling gadgets or gizmos and galore. There's letter openers, uh, tire gauges, uh, earbuds even. So uh, if, if you're running out of earbuds, uh, grab an earbud for your iPod or whatever. So with that, go be the church. Go love God, love others, serve all. Have a great week.